SCP-4231 The Montauk House The SCP universe is a lot of things, at different times and for different people. It's a universe that contains the inspirational, the humorous, the amazing, and the mundane, much like our own. But perhaps above all, it contains the dark. Much of what I've discussed throughout this series has been horrific, depressing, terrifying, awful, and dark. Whether or not the SCP we'll be looking at today is at the top of that list is ultimately subjective, but it indisputably contains all of those darker concepts. In truth, I'm doing the article a disservice by summarizing it, as it contains some really impressive writing, but I do what I do, so we'll move on. I highly recommend watching both of my previous videos on the Scarlet King and Dr. Clef, as this SCP connects to Clef, the Scarlet King, SCP-231, and SCP-2317. Let's dive in. 4231 is not presented like a normal SCP document, although normal is a little relative at this point. Instead, it's presented as a series of different articles, more akin to a tale. It starts us in 1989, as a Foundation commander, Alan Hall, has just led a team of personnel into the town of North Axis, Cornwall, in southwest England. The team went in after a nearby Foundation site received a phone call in their response and dispatch office, sent through a radio signal picked up by their sweeps. That radio signal was normally only used by Foundation responders, and Hall says he had no personnel dispatched at the time leading him to believe that the signal was of anomalous origin. The call consisted only of the sound of rushing water. With little to go on, and suspecting it was possibly just a computer error, Hall hung up and returned to work. The next day, however, the site received another call, again with the sound of rushing water. This time, Hall ordered the signal's origin to be triangulated, which led them to North Access. Under normal procedure, this alone would not warrant any further investigation, as the signal was not coming from Foundation equipment, but since the signal did show abnormal background radiation consistent with unstable Hume fields, they sent a team in. I've mentioned Hume levels before, but basically it's a measurement of the state of reality in an area. Our baseline normal reality has a stable Hume level and if a measurement shows anything above or below that, it means something is messing with reality in the area. Something or someone. Paul and a small team set out to the small town of North Axis to investigate. On the way there, he begins thinking about his time in college when he worked at a meat packing plant. He didn't mind the slicing and the butchering, but he did mind the smell. He recalls the visceral stench of the gore that he had to continually toss into a grinder, and he remembers thinking that once he was done with that place, he would never smell that stench again. He thinks about this because as the team approaches North Access, that same aroma of gore and death rises up, and grows stronger as they come closer. Some members of the team begin to panic at the smell wondering how many rotting bodies it would take for the smell to reach that far. Outside of the town, they come to a halting stop due to a rotting horse carcass blocking the road. The following section explains what happened after the fact, written many years later in 2014, referring to the event as the Cornwall Incident. North Axis was a town of roughly 1,000 residents, and it had a history with the occult. The dead horse in the road is not only severely rotted, but also desiccated, drained of moisture, which is fairly abnormal. The team called for backup, the horse is moved, and they continue closer to the town. Not long after, they come across another body, this time of a desiccated man in his early 40s. Again, the body is moved and they continue, finding plenty more bodies. A few hours after the team went out there, another Foundation site in Ireland is contacted to send in multiple squads, presumably because the London site has already sent in a bunch. North Axis is a quarantine crime scene, the site of the most deadly reality-bender massacre in history, with 1,200 dead. 
A thousand of these were residents of North Axis, so pretty much the entire town, while the other 200 were operatives from the Global Occult Coalition, part of something called the Ichabod Campaign. The Ichabod Campaign was a project by the GOC that resulted in the deaths of countless reality benders throughout the 1980s, and we'll learn a bit more about that later. The only things left alive in the town were six pregnant women, a man, and a newborn baby, all in poor condition. There were signs throughout the entire town of heavy flash flooding, but the nearby lake was completely dry. This event, the Cornwall Incident, is the climax of SCP-4231, an extremely violent outburst from an interaction between two reality benders. We'll get introduced to those two reality menders in a second, but the next section starts by copying some text from a GOC field manual about type greens, the term they use for reality benders. It explains how 99% of type greens go through the same developmental process with their abilities. First, they deny their ability to warp reality, trying to rationalize it in some other way. Some type greens never make it past this step self-suppressing their own capabilities, but most go on to the experimentation phase. They acknowledge that they can warp reality and begin to test their limits, either slowly and methodically, or with a small number of rapid jumps in capability. Eventually, they will proceed to the stability phase, where they have discovered their limits and boundaries, and they learn to maintain control over their powers, including not using them. A number of type greens will remain at this step, attempting to live a normal life, only using their abilities in private and not harming others. The GOC typically does not hunt these entities down, but sadly, most reality benders proceed to the final phase, the child god state, where they become obsessed with the power they possess. They use their abilities for personal gain at the cost of others, exhibiting reduced empathy for other humans inability to accept personal faults, and megalomania. The section ends by noting that teenage and young adult type greens will typically use their abilities for sexual purposes, which leads us into the introduction of our two reality benders. Let me preface this by explaining that the relationship between these two young adult reality benders is manipulative, abusive, and unhealthy. Rather than going into intimate detail, like the actual article does, I'll attempt to summarize the situation without making things too heavy. The whole point of SCP-4231 is how wrong this relationship is, so I want to take extra care in making sure you, as a viewer, are aware of it, since I'm going to skimp on the details. The article itself comes with a warning that it contains graphic depictions of sexual assault, and that is true, but since I'd like to maintain monetization and try to focus on the story, we're going to gloss over some things. Again, I'd recommend reading the piece yourself afterwards to get the full impact. With all that being said, our two reality benders are named Lily and Francis, and it's Lily that's the real problem in this relationship. Our introduction to them is Lily pushing herself onto Francis in bed with Francis both internally repulsed, but also obedient out of a perceived obligation. Francis is quiet, reserved, and submissive, while Lily is fearsome and dominant, a predator compared to his prey. Francis is confused about whether he actually loves her, as he knows this isn't right, and this isn't how things should be, but he also feels like he's supposed to be happy he has someone. As I said, an unhealthy relationship, to be sure. Next, we get an actual SCP document for 4231, the designation for a three-story building in the former town of North Access, previously inhabited by Lily and Francis. It lists that Lily was 5'7", 150 pounds, 28 years old, and recently pregnant at her time of death. Her body was found in the upstairs bedroom of the building, with a single gunshot wound in her head. Francis is listed as 5'3", 145 pounds, 27-year-old male, making him both younger and smaller than Lily was. 
At the time of his recovery by Foundation agents, he was under extreme mental distress, incapable of speaking coherently, with numerous scars, bruises, and broken bones. He was also constantly vomiting water and blood. He shows signs of severe psychological trauma and is contained by the Foundation. As the building they lived in is an SCP, that means it itself exhibits anomalous traits, because of both the prolonged violent presence of the reality benders there, but also because of SCP-2317, which was initially located underneath the nearby lake, and connected to the house by a passage. As I said earlier, hopefully you're already familiar with SCP-2317, but if not, a quick summary. 2317 is a primeval entity located in an alternate dimension accessible through a specific door. The entity is titled the Devourer of Worlds, and was contained in that dimension by a group of Arakeshian mystics who crafted seven chains out of the bones of the entity's seventh bride. Six of the chains are broken, and the Foundation has no idea how to stop the seventh one from breaking as well which would release the entity to continue devouring worlds. Well, the author did not intend for that entity to actually be the Scarlet King while writing 2317, they left the possibility open, and many have subscribed to this theory. Whether or not the 2317 entity is the Scarlet King doesn't really matter for 4231 though, as what matters is that Lily and Francis were living in a house right next to the hidden door that led to 2317. What's more is that the article states that the anomalous traits of 4231 were partially created due to the activation of the door, but we'll get back to that in a second. The building itself consisted of a top level apartment, a ground level flower shop, and a basement, which extended via a narrow passageway into another chamber underneath the lake. The top floor, the apartment, is where most of the anomalous qualities appear, left behind by traumatic imprinting from the reality benders. We'll be getting a short list of the effects of this imprinting in a bit, but it's extensive, and the apartment is actually studied by researchers looking into reality bender psychology, violence, and mental illness. Going through the underground passageway leads to a tomb structure dating back to medieval Europe. In this structure are seven equal-sized cells, 5 by 5 meter stone rooms with iron doors, secured with anomalous locks. When the locks were eventually damaged enough by Foundation personnel, the doors were opened, revealing six pregnant women. Unfortunately, they were not normal pregnant women, and were contained by the Foundation as SCP-231. Again, ideally you're familiar with SCP-231, but basically they were seven young females, each pregnant with something quite anomalous. The first six ended up giving birth to increasingly horrific and dangerous threats, so the seventh one is continually prevented from giving birth through a procedure, Procedure 110 Montauk. The details of this procedure are left unexplained in the original article, left only to imagination, as being something utterly reprehensible. SCP-231 does have direct connections to the Scarlet King, at least in the original article, as the women were retrieved from a cult calling themselves the Children of the Scarlet King. SCP-4231 tells us that this was a lie though, and that the women were actually contained in cells underneath a lake in North Access Cornwall, right next to the door leading to SCP-2317. That door was eventually removed from under the lake and taken to a Foundation site. The last room in this tomb is filled with hundreds of different artifacts, notably exactly 500 human bones decorated with strings and fabric, seven heavily decorated ritual altars, and elaborate carvings of a one-eyed horned beast believed to resemble 2317. Additionally, the hallway connecting all these rooms is covered in carvings depicting scenes from the Arrakesh Codex, a book mentioned in the 2317 documentation that explains how the mystics contained the entity in 1894 BCE. As the house was built in 1974, 
and the tomb dates back to medieval Europe. It's unknown how it came to be attached to the house. The Foundation suspects that the tomb might actually be an intricate replica created by Lily based on text in the Arrakesh Codex. Let's piece some things together then. There's no doubt that Lily was involved with the containment of the six pregnant girls, as well as the 2317 entity. If we believe that she replicated the creation of the tomb based on the Arrakesh Codex, it raises a lot of questions. Where did she find the Codex? Where did she get the girls? And what exactly was her goal? The 231 document makes it clear that there were seven girls involved, but here we only have six in cages. I won't get ahead of myself, and you might already know what the implication means, but let's move on. We get a short section that took place on December 2nd, 1988, around nine months before the Cornwall incident. Lily is recently pregnant, and Francis wanders away from bed, feeling disconnected from his own body. He opens the bedroom door to find that there's nowhere else to go. The rest of the apartment doesn't exist, and he ponders if it ever existed in the first place. He is trapped, whether physically or mentally, it's irrelevant. We then see a list of various anomalous effects present in the apartment of SCP-4231. These are imprints left behind by the interactions between the two reality benders, auditory and physical phenomena continually recreated from past events. These phenomena include audible arguments, passing insults, degrading comments, and violent outbursts, including the death of a cat. This is perpetual evidence of the abuse that Francis suffered from Lily, imprinted onto the house through subconscious reality bending. Sometimes the house itself will physically alter, with hallways extending indefinitely, or the apartment replicating itself upwards over and over for 80 hours. The final phenomenon listed is the viewing of a couple of events, one that took place before the Cornwall incident, and one that took place years after it, in 1995. The first shows Lily and Francis on the beach near the lake, with the two about to have intercourse. The second event is from an airport in Arizona, thousands of miles away and years afterward, where Francis watches an episode of Law and Order on a TV in the bar. The episode, pertaining to sexual abuse, makes Francis realize and begin to reconcile what had happened to him. He now worked for the Foundation, but was called in every year to discuss what had happened, and he wished he could just quit and work at a Walmart somewhere. He wakes up later with fresh marks on his body corresponding to his old injuries, as a result of his subconscious reality-bending powers working on himself. Cutting back to the beach, when they go back to the house, it fills entirely with water for 79 hours before dematerializing. The next section is from a confiscated document, meaning that it wasn't written by the Foundation, titled The Curious Case of SCP-4231-B, referring to Francis. Francis apparently had trapped himself at the top of the house with his newborn baby during the Cornwall incident to escape the floods. After being interviewed, it was ascertained that he was unaware of SCP-231, 2317, and even the anomalous imprinting on the house. When Foundation agents arrived during the incident, they ended up chasing Francis through the house for miles and miles, as he continually expanded it using his powers. Eventually, they smoke him out with sleeping gas and contain him. The author states that Francis would end up causing numerous debates among the Foundation, principally because he is something that they didn't believe reality benders could be, traumatized. He vomits water because of the flood he tried to escape from. He wakes up with self-inflicted bruises and cuts based on previous wounds, and he exhibits traits of PTSD and dissociative identity disorder. In time, he develops a completely separate personality to escape from this trauma. His new personality is the opposite of his original, eccentric, flamboyant, even inflammatory towards others, and this personality seems to have no knowledge or care about Lily, his child, North Access, or anything that transpired there. But the trauma still exists, 
and Francis deals with it in different ways. During initial treatment by the Foundation, Francis asks to not be filmed, and in fact to remain completely anonymous throughout the investigation. The Foundation, being the Foundation, of course refuses, so Francis uses his abilities to obscure his face from any form of recorded media. The Foundation continues to refuse any of Francis' requests for anonymity, privacy, and abstaining from physical contact. During the first two weeks of containment, as the Foundation continues to bombard Francis with tests and interviews about what happened, his mental condition significantly worsens. In short, they treat him more like a test subject than a person, and eventually Francis stops allowing it. While this does involve him using his abilities to block his face from cameras and breaking equipment, it mostly involves his new personality refusing to cooperate with any of the Foundation's inquiries and tests. He rips out IV lines and patches, deliberately insults and belittles staff, and refuses all medication and therapy to help his condition. He still suffers from night terrors and panic attacks, but as soon as any staff come to assist, he brushes them off. We see that this confiscated document was written by someone named Lady Agora, who claims that she is a sigil master, translator, and worshipper of many. We'll hear from her again. We then get a series of emails exchanged between the O5 Council, discussing Francis. As expected, their tone is cold, clinical, and discompassionate. They refer to Francis' outbursts as civil disobedience, rather than recognizing that they are the cause of his worsening problems. They do recognize that he has a high degree of control over his reality-bending abilities, and begin to discuss whether or not to contain him. After all, a reality bender with their powers in check could be a valuable tool. They mention that he had worked with the GOC as part of the Ichabod campaign under the code name Ukulele. If that doesn't ring some bells for you, then I'll assume you haven't watched my video on Dr. Clef. If it's not clear by now, Francis is Dr. Clef, or at least one depiction of him. While a lot of details about Dr. Clef are pretty fluid, there are a few generally concrete things. One is that he is anomalous, two is that he used to work for the GOC, and three is that he's a bit of a jerk. We can check all those boxes for Francis now with his new personality, but there's more to be gleamed here. It's often mentioned that when Dr. Clef was younger, he was in a relationship with another anomalous entity and fathered a young girl, who ended up in Foundation custody. While it's generally accepted that this entity was some sort of goddess, the exact details are a little murky, partly because Clef tends to lie about a lot of different things. Although Clef isn't usually depicted to be an actual reality bender, 4231 reconciles this fact by claiming that Clef views his abilities as a medical disability more than anything else meaning that he self-suppresses his capabilities. An O5 says that Francis had a really solid kill record under his belt while at the GOC, so good that it bordered on obsessive, and his later kills were pretty gruesome. This means that, while Francis was in a relationship with a reality bender, he was also out working for the GOC, gruesomely killing hundreds of reality benders. It seems that he was taking out his internal frustrations with Lily on others. The O5 says that they don't know who the abusive one was in the relationship, despite plenty of evidence proving it. They also refer to Lily as SCP-231-1, meaning that the Foundation is assuming she was one of the seven pregnant girls. The birth of Lily's child apparently started the Cornwall incident, again according to the Foundation. Another O5 corrects the previous overseer about the abuser, telling them that Lily was pretty clearly the orchestrator of this entire thing. Another retorts that they don't trust Francis and his testimonies about what happened, because he ended up murdering Lily. They believe that it's possible Francis orchestrated this entire thing as a cover-up, including the traumatic imprinting. They suspect that Francis is playing the foundation, but another says that if he was, they'd be able to tell, 
and they'd already be dead. They move on, wondering about the other pregnant women they found, and whether or not Francis was involved with their impregnation. Ultimately, they go back to whether or not to contain Francis, and if they don't contain him, then whether he has a right to his child, or to bury Lily. They decide these are issues for the Ethics Committee, and mention possibly looking into adoption options for the child in the Cornwall area. Clef's child, of course, turns out to be SCP-166, the teenage succubus, later picked up from a convent in Cornwall, England. O5-1 says that it seems Francis really isn't their main concern at the moment, but rather SCP-231, and they must ascertain the Montauk ritual from the Arrakesh Codex as soon as possible. Let's discuss the Montauk ritual then, or rather the Montauk procedure. I mentioned it earlier as the horrific procedure carried out on the last remaining SCP-231 girl in order to prevent her from giving birth. There have been a number of different tales written about the procedure, including the idea that the procedure itself just involves reading the girl a bedtime story, and all that really matters is that people believe it to be a horrific procedure. The next section is another confiscated document written by Lady Agora, this time about SCP-231 and the Montauk procedure. Agora doesn't jump into talking about the procedure though, but instead discusses the extreme care and attention to detail that the Foundation takes when designing containment chambers and containment procedures. She makes a note that most people don't really care about how something is contained, but rather what is being contained. Agora goes on to explain how much time and effort goes into each containment procedure, far beyond what is shown in each SCP document. And while even I generally gloss over containment procedures when presenting SCPs in these videos, they are sometimes extremely vital to understanding an anomaly. SCP-2845, the deer, for example, is an anomaly with extensive and elaborate containment procedures more akin to rituals than science. Agora explains that the Foundation often bridges the gap between science and religion, measuring pig's blood with graduated cylinders in a prep room, and raising purebred black cats for the specific purpose of slaughter. She notes that the Foundation is more ruthless and exacting in their rituals than any group of worshippers in the outside world. That brings her to discussing SCP-231, an anomaly focused around the ritual enacted regularly to contain another horror. She doesn't provide any specific details about Procedure 110 Montauk, as the details don't really matter. She does, however, go over what we know about the procedure, the fact that the ritual requires two sets of staff, one set to carry out the procedure, and one set to watch. These staff members are taken to the location of SCP-231 while blindfolded, utilizing a number of different modes of transportation and several different routes. Those watching the procedure wear full-body protective clothing that obscures both their face and their voice, and for two months these people are only allowed to stay in their private room when not watching the procedure. Agora's point is that in the SCP document for SCP-231, we are given this information, but not any information about the procedure or chamber itself. The important part of this whole process is the visibility of the procedure, and the fact that people watch it. She describes what it would be like to work on 231 as the observation staff, arriving at an unknown location, a winding maze of man-made hallways and tunnels underneath a desert somewhere. You're given a small room with no internet or radio access, allowed to request DVDs to watch, and the only real face or voice you get to hear for the next two months aside from your own is the young girl going through the procedure every day. After this two month period is over, you get shipped back to the real world, and the experience has changed you. This is the real Montauk procedure. It's not really about what happens to the girl in the chamber, although it does have to be horrible, but it's about people watching the procedure being irrevocably changed. This is what the god wants, the Scarlet King, 
It wants the people watching to be affected. The Foundation goes through a number of people every year that have to be assigned to the Montauk procedure, and everyone that watches it is, in effect, under the influence of the Scarlet King, because they live in fear from then on. Agora says that in 1967, she was commissioned by the Foundation to decrypt the Arrakesh Codex, so the Foundation has had the Codex for quite some time. She found the job difficult, as the runes were old and strange, but she finished shortly after her son was born. It's revealed that the Codex would find its way into the hands of her son's childhood friend, meaning that Lady Agora is Francis's mother. She had raised him to never use his abilities, and eventually fled from something, abandoning him. She finishes by saying that her fear is that Procedure 110 Montauk is not about preventing the children from being born, and never has been, but instead is about making enough people fearful, and the Scarlet King can break the chains whenever he wants to. The next section is from someone at the Foundation writing about the GOC's Ichabod campaign to kill reality benders prematurely. Before the Ichabod campaign, most reality benders were left alone until they caused a problem, such as the disappearance of someone important or a string of murders. In the late 1950s, the first cant counters were developed, allowing the measurement of an individual's capacity for reality bending. The Ichabod campaign was a logical next step, because if you could prevent a reality bender from reaching phase 4 and really causing problems, then why not stop them earlier than that, since most reality benders end up causing problems. The Foundation didn't agree with it and didn't condone it, but they also didn't stop it either, because the Ichabod campaign was effective. Sure, it wasn't ethical to commit genocide just because 99% of reality benders ended up causing problems at some point, but it ultimately made everyone's lives easier. The Foundation official explains it like this. Animal rights activists speak out constantly about mice being used for research purposes, but never speak out against people using mouse traps in their homes. The reason is because mice are pests, causing death through disease and damage to buildings. Some people in the anomalous community speak out against reality benders being contained, and their bodies being used for various purposes, but they don't speak out against the Ichabod campaign, because reality benders in the wild cause problems. Due to this, the Ichabod campaign is still going on, although they have tightened the regulations. In its heyday, 75% of all reality benders across the world were killed with the average lifespan of a reality bender being eight years old. In the mid-1980s, Francis was a GOC agent during the Ichabod campaign, and we have a segment about him at a bus station after a recent mission. He washes the blood off of his arms, and signs himself up for another mission, so that he doesn't have to go home. He calls up Lily, as he always does, though, and she calls him a liar about something for the millionth time. Between this, the stress, the six months of straight missions, and the lack of sleep, something breaks inside Francis, and he begins to cry while on the phone. Lily continues to berate him, calling him a fat, stupid liar, and she says that he's crazy and he'll soon lose control of his powers, and the GOC will find out about him. She says that he better come home so that she can keep an eye on him and protect him. After Francis hangs up, he continues to cry and wonders how long it will be until his fellow agents murder him for finding out he's a reality bender too. He can feel that things are changing with Lily and with himself, and he ponders if it's her that's changing into another one of those monsters that he's being paid to kill, or if it's him that's turning into a monster. Francis stops crying, and Agent Ukulele of the GOC gets back onto the bus forgetting about his momentary breakdown. Speaking of the GOC, the next section is from the point of view of a GOC CODA, the head dispatcher and quartermaster, so a pretty high rank. This CODA had been overseeing the Cornwall mission over the last nine months, 
which started with sending in a few agents to check out some abnormal radiation in North Axis. Those agents never returned, so more and more teams were sent in until nearly 200 Ichabod campaign agents were sent into North Axis. They had tracked the source to a single house and the lake next to it, but the reality of the town was becoming increasingly unstable overall. During a vulnerable moment, the Coda sends in a squad of 30 agents with bombs equipped with reality anchors with the intention of blowing up the house and the reality benders with it. Because of some flash flooding, Coda tells the squad to walk, putting them at risk. The men set up the bombs as the water reaches waist high, but Coda hesitates and things escalate quickly. The water both suddenly rises up to their chests, submerging the bombs and short-circuiting them, and also quickly rises in temperature. The bombs do not detonate, and the water flooding the town comes to a sudden boil, cooking the agents and the town civilians alive. This GOC signal, of the sound of boiling water, is inadvertently picked up twice by the Foundation, leading them to come check out the aftermath. We're in the heart of the Cornwall incident now, and the following section gives us our first perspective from during the event, from the POV of a horse, Chestnut. Chestnut is in a stable with a number of other horses, as the water rises up past their hooves. Their owner finally shows up and lets them out of their stalls one by one. The other horses bolt out of the stable, but Chestnut stays with the owner, who grabs a saddle. The man was closest with Chestnut, as he had been grieving the sudden disappearance of his wife nine months earlier. As you might suspect, his wife had been abducted by Lily as part of her rituals. The two leave the stable into the storm raging outside, and Chestnut slowly pushes through the deep water. The horse heads towards the entrance of the town, but the reality of the town had been warped, and there was no escape. The two find themselves suddenly stepping into the lake, where the water was boiling. The horse stumbles backwards until reaching the barn again, but the town is filled with screams as the boiling water cooks everything it touches. Eventually, Chestnut and her owner succumb to the water as well. We switch to Francis's perspective during this time, as he helps Lily give birth to a baby girl, oblivious to what is happening to the town. The doctor they call never arrives, but the baby is born regardless, and Francis feels a swell of love he didn't think was possible anymore, as he holds his daughter. The feeling makes him suddenly fiercely protective of her, because he hadn't felt love like this in years. The girl's name is Mary, chosen by Lily, and Francis begins to envision a scenario in which everything works out for him, Lily, and Mary. He envisions Lily going back to her old self when they were teenagers. Neither of them use their powers. She works the flower shop, and he still works for the GOC occasionally. White picket fence around their picturesque house next to the lake, with Christmases and birthdays and everything fine and dandy. But part of Francis knew this wouldn't ever work out, because nothing could fix Lily now, not even a daughter. He recognized that what has been happening with Lily is the same progression that happens to every reality bender he's killed, and he never questioned those diagnoses. He had stowed a rifle under the bed in preparation of this moment, but he wasn't sure he could go through with this. He didn't feel angry the same way he had seen men on TV being angry when murdering their wives. Despite this, he knew he had to do it, because she would eventually kill him and if he tried to flee, she would very likely go on some kind of rampage, possibly killing Mary. Francis is oblivious to the outside world, and has been for some time, because Lily keeps him trapped in the house, and maintains a placid image through the windows. The water has reached the stairs leading up to the apartment now, and Francis needs to act, for himself, for his daughter, and to end Lily's suffering. Lily asks to hold her daughter, and for a moment Francis looks at her and sees why he used to love her. He also sees what she has done to him over the years, 
how meticulously she has broken him down and trapped him here in this relationship. He tells her that he loves her, but wonders why he still does after everything she's done. He realizes that he'd rather be treated like this than risk being alone, and he desperately wishes it could all work out, but knows that it won't. She gets distracted by the sound of the water and turns, saying that she needs to tell Francis something. Francis draws on his cold, GOC instinct and grabs the gun under the bed, shooting her in the head mid-sentence. For all her power and control, Lily is dead from a single shot. Francis grabs Mary and begins to run downstairs, stepping into the boiling water coming up the stairs. In his panic, his abilities begin replicating the apartment upwards, and he continues to run and run and run. A reality bender in control of their powers and with a sound mind could easily escape, but Francis keeps running. He runs through the apartment over and over as memories of his time with Lily resurface, and it's possible that he's running because of Montauk, the word from the Arrakesh Codex referring to the fear caused by the Scarlet King. He keeps running as the Foundation agents arrive and chase him through the anomalous apartment but he isn't really running from them. Eventually, they gas him and he passes out. The Cornwall incident finishes, but the damage has been done and will continue to be done. A few months later, as Francis continues to get barraged with questions regarding his time in North Axis, his alternative personality begins to come out. During one interview, Francis removes his shoes and socks and anomalously pulls out a small container of nail polish. He begins to paint his toe and fingernails, and eventually Foundation personnel confiscate the nail polish. Francis pulls out another bottle and continues to paint, with this cycle repeating for five hours, and Francis answering no questions during that time. A few months go by, and in another interview, Francis begins to pull out false eyelashes from his pockets adhering them to his arms. Three hours later, 548 pairs of eyelashes have been attached to his arms. He has answered no questions, and the interview is concluded with him remarking that he's making his arms fuzzy. A year later, Francis is going through his annual questioning about the Montauk house, and he pulls out a single microscope slide. He answers no further questions, and the slide becomes the subject of a four-month-long investigation by teams connected to SCP-4231, 231, and 2317. The investigation concluded that the microscope slide was entirely blank, with no abnormal properties. By 2017, none of the annual questionings of Francis have resulted in any additional information. It wasn't long after being contained that Foundation psychologists recommended that Francis be allowed to work as an agent, since containment was significantly worsening his mental condition. Of course, we know this ended up happening, as Francis became known as Dr. Clef, but he would be continually monitored and annually questioned due to his abilities and his past trauma. The next section shows off three different point of views from 2016, connected to North Access. The first is a group of men in a bar 12 miles from North Access. They are sitting around in the evening, waiting for something to happen. Apparently some people have been passing by on the road every night recently. Finally they arrive, passing by in new, unmarked trucks. They are hauling steel girders and electrical wiring, and the men discuss what these mysterious people are constructing over in North Access. They know that North Axis is a ghost town, but there's some disagreement about what happened to it. The official story was that it flooded, but some suspect it was a fire. One of the men had seen it though, because he was anomalous himself, unbeknownst to the others, and felt a pull to check out North Axis. At the edge of the town, he felt the warmth, and saw into the bubble around the town. He saw the town boiling away and sinking into desolation. Rather than telling them though, he simply says that he didn't see anything. He's afraid though, of who these people are, 
and what they might be building where North Access used to exist. Next, we hear about Robert Scranton, creator of the Scranton Reality Anchors. Robert's father had also worked for the Foundation as an engineer, and it was him who took the Arrakesh Codex to Lady Agora to translate in hopes of figuring out how to stabilize reality. His father hadn't quite succeeded, leaving the project to Robert. Robert didn't quite have the same kind of trust in ancient ritual magic translated by a witch, but he soldiered on. Scranton reality anchors are used in plenty of SCPs, but the specifics of their construction aren't usually touched on. This article is saying that their construction partially revolves around rituals taken from the Arrakesh Codex. The Foundation decides to build a factory solely devoted to the construction of SRAs, and quite curiously they decide to build this factory in North Axis Cornwall. The spot they chose would need a few Scranton reality anchors itself, but other than that, it was perfect. The only problem was the issue of supply, as the ritual for constructing these anchors requires specific components. Robert wasn't exactly sure how they were going to get these components, as he mentions that so far they've just been using old supply from the 80s, but it was running out. Now, in this video, where have I mentioned the decade of the 1980s before? If you answered the Ichabod campaign, you'd be correct. The ritual components necessary for the construction of Scranton reality anchors come from the deceased remains of reality benders. Wonderful. We then get taken back to Coda at the GOC, as he sits next to the head of the GOC in a facility. The two sip tea as they listen to various radio signals from around the world, GOC agents going after reality benders. The head of the GOC mentions that he's been thinking about relaunching the Ichabod campaign, presumably with the same intensity as in the past. How interesting that at the same time that the Foundation is desperately in need of dead reality benders, the GOC is thinking about relaunching a campaign to slaughter reality benders. Coda immediately says no, to which the other man asks if he's worried about another Cornwall incident. Coda goes into a monologue about the ridiculousness of calling 1200 people being boiled alive an incident. He's obviously still pretty sensitive about sending his men into North Access and having to listen to them being cooked. He asks the man if he wants a second Cornwall. The head of the GOC says that if Coda does his job right, there won't be a second Cornwall. Sounds like the Ichabod campaign is back on. The penultimate section is back in 1989, with Lily and Francis sitting in their apartment. Lily continually asks Francis to tell her the truth about something, but Francis just continues to cry, pleading that he doesn't know what truth she wants to hear. Much later, he ponders how much self-awareness she had about what she was putting him through. Thirty years later, Dr. Clef was in a better place, barely thinking about North Access aside from occasional nightmares. He was good now, or as good as Dr. Alto Clef could be. The final section is from an aquatic containment chamber somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. The point of view of this section is from a Scranton reality anchor, number 4345, who had recently woken up. There was a consciousness inside of this anchor, and it wonders if the other nearby anchors are awake as well. It doesn't know how long it's been awake, or how long it had been there, or what it was before this. It does know that it hadn't always been here in the ocean, and after a few years of bobbing in the water near the ocean floor, it finally pulls free a single memory from a previous life. It remembers a house. Yes, Lily was turned into a reality anchor, and she's gaining awareness back. In the section of 4231 that discusses the tomb underneath the lake, there is some hidden text an excerpt from the Arrakesh Codex. In the interest of making this video even longer, I'll read it verbatim. In a life before now, I was a powerful beast enslaved to a village, for whom I pulled carts of grain. I was fed and housed and walked among them, 
but was but a creature speaking their tongue, for which I grew dissatisfied. One night I broke free from my restraints, and found myself running wildly in the forest, and the forest did bend around me. My feet were hail, and my body thunder. I brought desolation for which I felt nothing, and the earth enabled me with submission. I ran for seven days and seven nights, for which time I brought plague on what I did perceive. They called me Theum, Web Spinner, the Torn Asunder. On the seventh night I was reckless with fatigue, and the world did not bend for me. I fell down a steep valley into the river Green. Having struck my neck on a boulder, the holy river drowned me in starlight and boiled the flesh from my bones. No creature came for me, for there was no creatures of my kind. The river delivered me. Oh, how much agony I was in. My broken neck came to rest on the bank of a stream running through a farmer's field, who was grazing his cattle. He said unto me, I am not Kether, but I will save you, as you will save me. He read a holy passage of the green, and carved into my broken neck words of forgiveness, then wrapped it in cloth and twine. I protected his family for four generations. Spirit nor creature dared challenge me. The fourth generation blessed me and thanked me and delivered me unto the holy flame. Wild flowers did bloom in my ashes. My power returned to the earth, and I rested soundly. Mercy. Mercy, mercy, great is the red god who binds his angels to the waters. May heaven be merciful on my bones until the Lord pulls upon my yoke once more. Basically, this text describes a reality bender who is enslaved by a village to do their labor. One day it broke free, causing desolation in the region using its powers. Finally, though, through an accident, the reality bender died but maintained awareness. The neck bone of this reality bender ended up in the hands of a farmer who happened to be familiar with Arrakeshian magic and used the bone to effectively make a reality anchor, which protected his family for generations. After four generations though, the reality bender was laid to rest until the Scarlet King decides to call them once more. This text presents some worrying problems for the foundation who will almost certainly attempt to utilize the anchors for more than four generations, and the fact that the Scarlet King apparently has influence over these anchors. What's more is the problem with SCP-231, the girls that underwent the Montauk procedure until only one is left now. I said earlier that the Foundation assumed that Lily was the first of these girls, mentioned in the SCP-231 document as the girl killed during the initial raid. Although, yes, she also happened to be pregnant and gave birth, not all signs point to her being part of that group. According to the author, it's possible that Francis is actually one of the SCP-231 members, because who says that they specifically have to be girls? The idea that the concern is the children being born is what the Foundation believes, but these are ancient rituals, roughly translated by a witch so it's impossible to exactly say how everything connects. This, of course, gets even more confusing for readers when you have to juggle multiple different canons and tales. This was an incredibly lengthy and involved SCP, and it's somewhat amusing that at the end of all of it, some people might wonder, what exactly is SCP-4231? Based on the title and the way the text describes it, you'd say it's the house itself, but the house is of such relatively small significance compared to the other elements of this story. It's a rare SCP that combines so many different anomalous concepts into one, pulling from multiple different other SCPs and concepts, incorporating hidden text and interpretation. It's a divisive SCP, to be sure, due to its complexity, its length, its format, and its concept, but it's undoubtedly impressive. Again, canon in the SCP universe is a little different, and if you don't care for how this SCP messes with 231, 2317, the Scarlet King, Clef, and reality anchors, then just forget about it. If you accept it though, 
then it has some wide-reaching implications, the foremost of which being that the Scarlet King is empowered through fear, and the Montauk House is responsible for quite a lot of it. 